Hi everyone, this is Tori Vandalin with Prevent Connect. This is the final episode of our podcast with the authors of the study, Expanding the Frame, Institutional Responses to Students Accused of Sexual Misconduct. On this podcast, Jennifer Henkel, Joan Sabochnik, and Jill Dunlap discuss the primary prevention implications of respondent services and restorative justice on a campus and community ecosystem. As you all know, Prevent Connect is really interested in how we can create environments where sexual violence doesn't happen. How do you see respondent services on campus as a part of a comprehensive prevention strategy? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And and basically what I believe is that, you know, how we respond to cases um, will have a huge impact on all the cases which are not brought forward. And we do know that most people who are harmed by sexual um, violence do not report. So they're not actually visible within the campus system, but they often can be very visible on campus. So if, for example, um, if we don't offer any options, if the only option is to expel a student, um, someone may not want to report because they may not want that student expelled. Um, If we actually are offering a broader range of options, then, and actually particularly sort of something we've addressed a little bit earlier, but also sort of make sure that people understand that help is available that it allows us to sort of think about prevention in a, in a little bit broader context. And um, in addition to the example maybe that Jennifer gave earlier, but that there are programs, for example, in, in Germany, where um, maybe it's been a little bit more around child sexual abuse, but they've shown that basically when they say help is available, that people will come forward for that help voluntarily. And we've also seen that, as Jennifer said, in Canada, where um, whether we don't have Title IX in Canada, that people will come forward for help. And that's an opportunity that we're ignoring right now. And so if we want to be able to think about responding differently to the people in cases we do have, that we might actually be able to change the environment so that more people will maybe reach out for help before anybody is harmed. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a great quote from the Institute of Medicine, and I realized that it's actually from 2001. So I love this quote so much, I'm still using it 20 years later. But it basically says like it's unreasonable to expect that people will change their behavior easily when so many forces in the social, cultural, and physical environment conspire against that, such change. Mm-hmm. So if we're asking you know, students to change their behaviors, to think about the behavior differently. We need to think about what we're challenging them to do individually and what are they challenging to do in their relationships. We also need to think about what are we going to change the environment? So one of the things I would like to think about is that when a student does come forward and make a complaint, um, file a complaint, and then that particular individual situation is addressed, the campus should also be thinking about what were the circumstances that led to that, not just for those individual decisions, but what was in the campus environment and can something in the campus environment be changed so that that actually that the questions are not even on the table at that point. And that's something which I think, again, is an opportunity we're ignoring. Um, and especially when we think about how to prevent the perpetration of sexual violence, because that allows us to intervene before anybody is harmed. And that's a piece which I think with the respondent services, we're beginning to see then that not all people are the same, that both our interventions need to be different, but also our prevention strategies might need to be different as well. Joan, I feel like that really relates to what we know about sexual violence being such a complex issue. And in this report, you all highlight that folks who have caused harm are also super complex. Um, who knew that all humans are complex beings? Um, <laughs> <laughs> who'd have thought? So you make the point that a one-size-fits-all approach is not enough to, to address this complexity. This is something that we know from survivor support services, something that we know from prevention too, and this is something that folks are exploring with respondent services as well. So what are the opportunities for prevention and sexual education that may exist or could exist in respondent services? I think Jones hit on this a lot already um, in terms of the idea that, you know, we can't treat all respondents as, you know, as the same, um, coming from the same background or having the same motivation or, um, you know, sort of needing the same interventions in the same way that we don't anticipate that for survivors. And so I think it's just a little bit of a, um, 
a mind shift to think through what the differences are in those students who have um, like either been reported or, you know, come forward of their own or have been reported and are found not responsible. That just the, the finding of not responsible doesn't mean that the institution has no responsibility to that respondent either, right? It's not that the end of the process mm-hmm. is done, so therefore we're all done here. Um, because there are ongoing repercussions for both students um, in really significant ways. And so I think the idea that um, that's, I think, one of the main things that we that I, I think I hope that we got across in our training um, in January was that we really, you know, wanted folks to to think through how do we do this in a way that is meaningful to the students who are engaged with us in the support services that we provide. Um, and so I think, um, you know, I. I hope that we'll start to develop more resources around this as well as institutions of higher education. As Jennifer mentioned, I think a lot of the value of that training also was the folks that are doing this work finding one another, because I think similar to when um, campus advocates started coming together, uh, when I you know first started this work, it was like, oh, you do what I do too. I didn't, I didn't know there was anybody else on campus that, you know, on another campus that did that. And so I think there's, um, you know, best practices and um, and things that could be shared among those practitioners who are providing these support services that will enhance and improve the services that we're able to provide. Um, so I, you know, I'm happy to have Jennifer and Joan weigh in as well on that. And I'm not even sure I answered your question, but I, um, I do think that in addition to the complexity of the students that we're providing support services to, there's complexity in the types of institutions that we're talking to, right? Thank like you. they're yes. just, they're going to look very different from community colleges to four-year institutions to elite privates, you know? And so I think, um, you know, it's not just the students themselves that are complex, but the institutions and the contexts in which um, problematic sexual behavior happens that is also really important to consider. And I think I'd like to add to that is that I think that, you know, that there's both I think what we can be doing very differently when we recognize the complexity of the issue once once somebody's been harmed and once the complaint has been made and how do you respond, as we sort of talked earlier about holding the, the trauma that's been caused, but all um, to the to the complainant, um, but also how to make sure that we hold that person accountable who caused the harm, but also make sure that the intervention makes the most sense for you know, what, who they are um, in terms of what their cognitive understanding, their developmental, what the behavior was, what their motivation was, what the tactics they used. All those things are important to think about what the right intervention is. But also I would say that by looking at this, I think that what I really appreciate about this, I think, shift that I see happening um, is that schools are beginning to look at the whole picture and in a different, and I think in a different way. And I think it shows up in ways that, um, so for, you know, for example, was doing a training um, at a college recently where, you know, if we went, went to the, the bathroom and, and this is not a TMI moment, I promise. Um, and the, um, there was a sign in the bathroom, which was a great sign, which said, you know, that if, if you have been harassed or, and I think it also incorporated the bystander piece of like, you know, if you see someone being harassed, like here's a number to call. And, but what I don't see very often is that, you know, if you think that you may have harassed somebody, yes. where, where can you turn? And I think that when you offer res- services for respondents, it also opens the door then the expertise to also offer the services for someone who, you know, like I may have done, overstepped the line, but I'm not sure. And I want to get some help. Um, mm-hmm. So that I think to me sort of exemplifies this idea of sort of the whole picture. And um, and I think that I've seen that in lots of ways. For example, I just wrote a research article, which at least I personally hadn't seen until recently, where they talked about the higher rates of victimization among men who are living in fraternities. And usually when we talk about in fraternities, we talk about you know having addressing issues of perpetration. And we don't often think about that whole picture again. So I guess my hope is by doing this, so we'll begin to look at the whole picture and not have these almost because like we've been having little blind spots along the way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and really that's what prevention is all about, right? I mean, absolutely. It's great to respond to these things and people should continue to respond to these things. But what it really comes down to is if we want to end sexual violence, we've got to do something to, 
to meet it ahead, <laughs> ahead of the curve. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. That is such a great way to bring us back to, to prevention and all of this. And I really appreciate that you all brought up all of the complexities that happen in individual cases and how that has an impact on the campus environment or how administrators can can then go back and see what is what is missing in our environment or what exists in our environment that allows sexual violence to occur and what can we do about it um you know getting that that big picture look at there is a way to end sexual violence on our campus how is it and what what i really enjoy about this conversation is we're talking about there is a need to hold hold focus on the the trauma and harm that has occurred to the the survivor. There's a need for accountability for responding students, and, and there's a need to have what that intervention is make sense. Um, so we know this report will help campuses develop um, best practices or learn what the recommendations are for respondent services. How can this report also help campuses in developing a restorative justice process that can hold all of those things at once and maybe get to some of those bigger picture um, issues? I think for me, it's really making respondent services a part of a, of a restorative justice process. So the key to our RJ is that, well, a key component to me <laughs> for RJ is that everyone's willing, right? You're not going to do it if one party in a two party incident um, is completely unwilling to move forward. And I think it can be really hard to get buy in on the part of a responding party, especially if you have legal counsel that absolutely um, doesn't understand what RJ is or how it can be beneficial. I mean, if you look at the criminal justice system, even though some places have done a good job of integrating restorative justice, it's not what our criminal justice system is. So take a lawyer who only has experience in the criminal justice system, they're absolutely not going to promote that their client take part in this um, process. And so having individuals who are inside of the institution, administrators who are doing respondent services, and then helping explain to both a student and their legal counsel what RJ is, I think can be incredibly beneficial to getting that buy-in and then creating a more, a more restorative process, if you will. And I will just jump in here and give a NASPA plug because, you know, they sign my paycheck, but um, we're, <laughs> we're working, like, I think the, um, it, this was a really intentional um, effort on our part too. So we just released this report about respondent support services. And um, to follow on to that, we are working with um, David Carp and Karen Williamson um, at the Campus Prism Project um, to, they're doing a five things brief on what all student affairs administrators should know about restorative justice practices uh, in application to sexual misconduct cases. And so how to do it responsibly and ethically and all of those things. And so that is, you know, going to be published in the next couple of months. But again, I think it's a, a really good toolkit to give to administrators who are, um, who are attempting to implement respondent services. And um, I think for me, the, the, the other thing that I would add to what Jennifer said is that you know, one of the things that we want people to take away from this report is if they are intending to implement respondent support services to do it intentionally and to do it well. Mm -hmm. Because I think, again, that the very beginning of this, what we heard was, well, we, you know, have somebody in, you know, Title IX or we have somebody in legal counsel. And again, I'm not maligning either of those parties, but um, a lot of times, like Jennifer said, their bottom line is liability and risk management, and it doesn't center the student. And so, you know, Joan recenters us on that constantly when we present around what are the needs of the student who has potentially caused harm. And so, um, you know, that's what we do as student affairs administrators to center the student in the processes that we have at our institutions. But um, to assign an advocate to do this role who isn't willing to do it deserves both sets of students, both survivors and respondents. Um, and so, you know, assigning this to someone who just does not have 
a desire to provide these types of services and in an effort to be equitable in your processes is, is likely going to backfire, but also just isn't good practice, right? And so to be intentional and thoughtful and clear about what you're trying to accomplish with respondent support services and then doing that in a way um, that honors both parties, you know, if they're in currently engaged in a, in a process, but reporting parties and responding parties, but the broader range of, you know, students with problematic sexual behavior, for sure, um, I think is really what our goal is, is to, to get folks to do that in, a, in an intentional and thoughtful way. And to me, this is a great example of why I love having these conversations, because the piece I would want to add to this is that um, that there is a different level of accountability when you're working with the respondents. And so asking you certainly if the respondent is willing is important, but I think it's also important for the campus to have some level of expertise or access to expertise to find out, because willing in, in, in my mind would not be the only criteria and it's not enough, <laughs> that I would also want to make sure that that person understands the impact of what they've done so not just they're willing to participate and just saying, I'm sorry, is not enough. Um, but do they understand the impact of what they've had, of what their actions were? And also would want to know before entering into the process that, you know, given what the, the survivor wants in that particular case, is the person who caused the harm able to actually do that? And it may mean that they may not be able to do that right then um, for whatever you know, whatever sort of reasons, but they may actually be able to do that after they've entered into a treatment program or an education program and may need to do that first before they can get in, before they can actually um, participate in, in the restorative justice process um, fully. Um, also, we've talked about, you know, other, you know, whether it be developmental or um, cognitive challenges also they may have. So those are all things that need to be taken into account. So that's where I think, I guess the one piece maybe I'd say we haven't fully said is that the importance of having either the expertise on campus or access to expertise while working with respondents, working with students who have caused the harm is a piece which I would say is, you know, um, one of the, the, the key points, I guess, that I would love to make about, I think, one of the things that I keep bringing forth when we talk about it and why these kinds of conversations are so important. Mm hmm Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And um, campuses hold a lot of responsibility in both the students and their communities' lives. And it's so important that they do it well, they do it intentionally, they center students and that they, it's so important that campuses also have the expertise or the access to it in order to do it intentionally, do it well and center students in the process too. So we only have a, a little bit left with each other. This has been such a robust, amazing conversation with you all. And I so appreciate your time and your effort and energy, not only on this podcast, but in the work that you're doing to really advance um, campus climates that are free from sexual violence. So a moment of gratitude for, for you all and the work that you do and continue to do. Are there any other key points that you'd like to share on this podcast? I think something I want to kind of draw attention to is as an optimist, you know, looking at what is positive about this, absolutely. Um, and as any researcher could probably relate to, there's some things we wish we had asked and um, some specifics about like where staff are getting this training that we now know they're doing in-house. What does that training look like and specificity there? Um, however, and on a similar note, there's a lot of things that we got in our results that show that universities can be doing different things and more things, and there absolutely is room for growth. However, I think it still should be celebrated that schools have been doing something, um, and without even being told to do so. I mean, I know that's maybe a slightly negative way of being optimistic, but having been in higher education and us, I think seeing, look how long it took until we had the 2011 Dear Colleague letter for Kipsis to start doing things differently. Um, 
when it came to providing things for survivors and then uh, moving forward, this isn't something that was included in a dear colleague letter. This isn't something that even had quote unquote best practice. I remember being at the University of Michigan and my supervisor in my internship was developing a case management position for this purpose. And my understanding at the time was why on earth would we be doing that? But again, she was ahead of the curve. And so I think that is positive and it's a, a good win for higher education in starting to provide these services and them being where they are. And I, I don't think I have anything to add to I think it's wonderful. And I really would say just to echo that I, I do feel really hopeful after seeing after seeing the data from this report and that we also did some follow-up interviews that really saw some, I think, some really amazing shining examples of what schools are doing. I actually think that schools could be doing more. And I sort of guess maybe partly all of us agree with the, looking at this as, you know, half full, not half empty, you know, right. three quarters full. And um, but that there is more that needs to happen. And I'm incredibly impressed and excited about what I am seeing schools do. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I don't really have anything else to say. This is why the three of us work so well together, because we all just think all the same things. Um, but I, I will just say that I, I agree with Joan. I think this is um, what the report has described as the floor um, and where we hope you know things are at now, but that what, where we're urging campuses to go is really the ceiling, right, is to pr expand and um, strengthen the services that they may already have. Uh, and so you know, I'm, I'm hopeful and optimistic in the same way that my colleagues are. And I think seeing how many attendees were taking part in this pre-con session that we had at the strategies conferences says a lot about that and that institutions do want to do better and uh, make these services more robust and introduce them if they aren't already in existence at their institutions. So I think that's absolutely a truth and something that we aren't just hopeful we will see, but I think it's something we're already seeing. Mm -hmm. Thank you all again so much for this conversation. Thank you, Joan, Jill, and Jennifer. This has been fantastic. Um, and we can't wait to see the next uh, report, the next project that you all come up with. So thank you for joining us. It's been Thanks a for having us. Thank you.